Welcome, everyone, to Fleeting Thoughts, an altered TCG podcast, part of the Main Deck Podcast family. I'm Dan. And I'm Jordan. And today, we're going to talk about the importance of card draw and hand management in the lens of altered, as it is a little more important than most other games. I mean, card draw is king in all games, but particular in this one, it has a couple of extra details that we want to iron out to you guys so you can fully understand what we mean yeah i think that oh go ahead i I was just gonna say i think it's it's interesting to say it's more important than other card games because there's certainly i think there are card games where uh it's definitely like highly powerful um in in certain card games but yeah where there's the thing about altered is that reserve man and then and how that affects everything and i think that we'll we'll really be digging into that and the the meaning of the value of a card in altered it's just it's just slightly different because of that so that's that'll be a lot of fun but i think you were going to remind me jordan that before we do that we have to talk as real quick real quick as usual about how you can support main deck because we are our own sponsors for our podcasts um <laughs> if you enjoy fleeting thoughts the i think still the only altered tcg podcast in english um again please step it up like show me link if you know any others please link them i want to listen to alter other altered podcasts come on guys make some more but if you enjoy what we do here you can always support us by interacting with our videos and podcasts like comment subscribe rating us on spotify and itunes doing all that stuff is super super helpful thank you so much for that and if you play any card games other than altered and you want to go buy some cards for yourself and you maybe shop at TCG player. If you're in the United States or anywhere that they ship to, uh, you can always do that by using our affiliate link bit.ly slash shop TCGs bit.ly slash shop TCGs, or click the link in the description below and you can shop for your favorite singles there at market prices. And we get a, just a little kickback from that at no extra cost to you. So thank you so much for all of the ways that you support us here at main deck. Uh, all right. And Jordan, I think too, after we're finished with that, we're going to be digging into a few more mailbag questions. We have, we still have a number to get to, and I'm, uh, I'm actually starting to look forward to that the most. I love those conversations. I think, I think you guys have really wonderful questions. So, um, let's talk about cards and let's talk about mail. Those are my two favorite things in the world. For sure. For sure. So anything exciting been going on with you before we get into the real thick of it? Well, uh, you know, this is an interesting time for Alter just because we're we're just kind of waiting at, <laughs> at this point. Um, yeah. We actually, as we're recording this, I think there's just a couple days left to get in starter deck uh, and your starter deck choices and any anything you need to do to get your pledge all figured out. Um, so it does not do me, I think, any good to say make sure you've done that because I think this is going to release after that date. Uh, but uh, make sure you did do that in the past. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, this is we're in like we're in holding pattern period where we're just going to be waiting for updates from Equinox. Um, and you and I, Jordan, are just going to be kind of uh, I mean, we're we're exploring some of our other fun card games right now as we are getting excited about Altered. And I'm just pushing out our our weekly content, doing things like gameplay and stuff and just keeping that kind of keeping that fire lit for a while here until we get some more info to play with. How about you? Yeah, it's been the same. Been playing some other of our, our top picks for games. I'm um, getting excited that my local shop that's local to me will be on the Grand Archive train very, very soon. Um, Excellent. They're going to get a couple things in and they're going to be part of the new set, which I'm excited about. Uh, of course, Star Wars Unlimited released like this last weekend or the weekend before that. One of the two. Can't quite remember, but uh, been jamming those games um, and looking forward to Altered, of course perusing kind of theory crafting some different decks that i could put together and excited to see what i end up opening planning to see what they're going to announce at the gen con event see what kind of stuff is going to happen for altered yes all we know is there's going to be a big thing at gen con for altered we just don't know any details other than it will be a big thing let's i want to <laughs> i want to mention that because our group so so for anyone who hasn't been to gen con and i know we have an international audience here but i know people internationally travel to go to gen con too it's if you're like in the tabletop space it's not quite as big of a deal as uh as essen is 
um, in Europe. That's I think still the biggest tabletop convention. But Gen Con, I think it, Gen Con is the second, isn't it? Or is there Gen one Con is number one? two? Yeah, I, be- yeah. I believe. I believe it's a it's a massive convention. Um, and the, what I what we enjoy about Gen Con, Jordan, is is that usually all of our favorite TCGs are holding some pretty cool events there. And uh, every year we we travel down. We have some days. We're actually we're going down a day early this year. Some of us. Um, you're still joining us, I think, on the usual Wednesday, but a bunch of us are going down on Tuesday and we're just going to be chilling and hanging out and maybe playing casual stuff. And um, then we're going to have some days where it's going to be a little like a little more focused. We're going to have tournaments for different games to play. Um, we're going to have some wonderful food, go out to dinner, you know, just just chill and hang with our, our friends for a while. Um either drink away our misery when we lose in our competitive tournaments or drink to our success or whatever, <laughs> you know, we'll have fun. Um, and, uh, and responsibly, of course. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, I, it's something that I recommend to, uh, any TCG fan to try at least one time, head down there, sign up for a few cool events, do some magic casual event. If you want to find your favorite TCGs and take time to not have any events on the schedule and just explore, the exhibit hall it's uh it's a fun time i can't wait yeah and that's that's one of the big takeaways is don't overbook yourself when you do decide to go uh the some of the big features are going to take you some time to get through and kind of process and you know really absorb everything around you so you're going to want a lot of at least one full day worth of free time to just yes experience stuff um, i will say actually i think i think if i remember right i think we have an old it was either a main deck podcast or it might have even been a Metamaniac show episode about preparing for Gen Con. I think it was a main it deck was, podcast. Was that we, right? Yeah, it was. A, I know we also had the car cast where we we did a, we, we did a right. podcast while we were the driving in cast. the car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've tried some interesting things in the past. Um, the car, you know, I don't know. The car cast, the car cast wasn't bad, actually. It was kind of fun. It was kind of off the cuff. Uh could do it again yeah, sometime it. And, and it took our minds off of being cramped in the the truck with like six people in one yeah life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but yeah so we have a whole episode i think in the in somewhere in the past about preparing for gen con if you want to hear more about our thoughts there i think a lot of that that's still still very valid um information even if it was from a few years ago um but uh the big thing as you said is that we so when we prepare for Gen Con, we have to prepare pretty far in advance. It's I mean it's in January. We get our we everyone gets badges and we get in the lotto system for the for getting hotel rooms, and then we have a, a like a big panic time when we're all trying to get like hotels booked. Who who's got the next time? Like we got to get you know we, we still need another room and yeah we were doing that this year. Um, we do all that preparation and then we sit here and we wait for them to actually announce the events. <laughs> so yeah, that's, the events are sadly like one of the last things that get like brought out with their event calendar thing and even then that's only the events that people have put in for already because then there's still more events that get added later because people are late or developers are like they're unsure if they're going to come in and then they you know they nab their their booth and they're like oh now we're doing events here so another wave of tickets go out and yeah (sighs) and altered as as we've said as they've said is going to have a big presence at gen con sort of like an early early release celebration um of some kind and we don't know what exactly that encapsulates um but you can bet that we'll be at it um and and excited just to engage with the community and everything there so um if anyone out there is looking to to get to hang out with us in person or whatever and, and chat about stuff. We will be at whatever is going on for altered at Gen Con um, in August of this year. So I uh, would really love to get to chat with you guys. Um, if you do head out, definitely yeah. recommend it. It'd be very cool. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, that was a great, that was a great little aside because I, I totally forgot. Like it's very relevant to talk about, especially when there isn't, a lot more going on in altered space right now, but we will definitely, I, you know, it might be a good idea, Jordan. I'm just going to plan while we're recording live. <laughs> it might be a good idea when we get information about the Gen Con events to talk a little more about that on fleeting thoughts. Um, oh, for I sure. think, and That's yeah, I think that would pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. 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 Um, for now, do you, do you want to, do you want to chat a little bit about, about cards and card draw and et cetera? Oh. 
Oh yeah, all the time. We love drawing cards here at Main Deck. It is the best. It's probably the best three words you can see tacked on a card. If you see draw a card, you're like, this can't be bad. At worst, like, this is medium. <laughs> yeah, you see that on a card and you're like, I could probably just slam this in the deck and we'll do fine. Like, yep, this, absolutely. this won't be the first or even second card that gets cut, no matter how good or bad the deck is. Yeah, It'll yeah. probably still be here for a while. Um, but for yeah, sure. So in Altered, um, the game has a little bit of a different flow. There's some very important mechanics built into the game that I think makes card draw just that little bit more important. And not just card draw as well. I also want to focus on hand management in this game. Because uh, some games, plowing everything in your hand on the field gets you that advantage. You draw more cards later, you play stuff, and the advantage just kind of builds and builds and builds. But with Altered, we have some factors such as at the end of every turn and, you know, outside of Anchor or some other, you know, card effects, your board will be cleared. So if you spend, you know, if there is some weird deck that turn two could play their entire hand, that might be cool, but... Now you have no cards to play for the duration of the game, and your opponent's going to have a healthy streamline of stuff being played. Um, along with the fact that you have the all-important choice of, do I play a resource this turn or keep it for extra cards? That comes into effect with drawing cards. The more cards you have, the more options you have to be like, yeah, I don't need this right now. Let's tuck it in. Versus if you're living off the top deck, you have a 50-50 on which card you hopefully can use and which card you have to put down as a resource. Um, there's just so many facets to think about in this game when it comes to card draw and your the management of your hand in the early game to make sure you have enough to make it to late game if your plan falls through and other things to consider such as slamming your whole hand down in one turn might literally yield you nothing because you can yeah. slam your hand down and your opponent didn't have anything to compete with you anyway and you have you know seven on all stats on this side and they have a one 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 and you're like you did it you played your cards but you played yourself in all of actuality <laughs> or or like the opposite direction too you can slam down multiple things on a side and then they can just put down shenlong and what so i want to introduce a concept because there are we we're going to have tcg players in the podcast but we also have people who are maybe newer to the tcg space and maybe aren't super familiar with some of these terms, but um, in a lot of card games, at some level, you talk about something called card advantage, which is just, uh, you know, who, you know, having more cards than your opponent or using your cards more efficiently than your opponent, which is where I'm going to be going with this. Um, the idea is that we'll, we'll uh, actually sometimes quantify that as it's never, it's never telling the whole story to just quantify something, reduce it down to some some numbers, but it gives you a snapshot of one facet of, of sort of the picture that you're talking about. So for example, if you have, uh, if your opponent has two cards in play and you use one card from your hand that somehow removes or negates those two cards, you can say you spent one card and got rid of two, or in other words, you've two for one to your opponent. You spent one, got two, two for one, right? Uh, so we're going to, I think we're going to return to this idea a bunch in this conversation. Because it is a it is a nice way just to kind of look at to to just take a step from a different angle and kind of see oh you know like maybe there's a way to think about efficiency and value from that angle but just on a quick level like if you put down three units and they put down a Shenlong and the Shenlong is higher stats than your three units combined there was a at least a I'm gonna ignore reserve right now because that's that plays into this conversation massively and it complicates everything but just on a basic level. That was they spent one card and you spent three. You got nothing. They got the success there. So they they pseudo one for three or sorry, three for one. You three for one. You or you got one for three, um, which I think like Tate, when you put it in that perspective, it's like. Ouch, <laughs> you know, that's that's like that's pretty rough when one card gets to beat everything there, even if you spent the same amount of resources on it, uh, right? Yeah, for sure. And I'm really glad you brought that point up because uh, that's partially why I kind of wanted to touch on this subject today is because in a previous podcast, um, actually, I think it was our actual last podcast, uh, we talked about the importance of one and two drops. And I wanted to bring this 
this up afterwards just to kind of show people that, you know, I don't want them to take the last podcast and be like, oh, so my deck's just going to be a bunch of ones and twos and maybe a few threes and fours so I can have all these options because sometimes that's also not the correct play. There's a time and a place for both things. And if you jam your deck and rely on a bunch of the cheap units, like Dan said, you're going to end up spending two or three cards just to have them be negated by one big play that the opponent does. And now you're out cards and your options have now dwindled because you spent three cards or they spent one or two. I think an interesting facet of this is just how much control players have in in managing exactly how they spend those cards and where they play them. I mean, like this comes up in, in a lot of the gameplay videos I put out, which, by the way, I want to mention, I am I am clearly not a top tier altered player i just enjoy playing it and i do enjoy exploring the strategy i know there are there are players out there who are uh who are seeing me making mistakes and everything and i absolutely welcome your comments in there and often i'm going to tell you too often you'll you'll comment like dan you should have done this and i'll be like yeah i realized it because i watched through the video as i'm editing and i'm like what was i thinking like why did i say that <laughs> <laughs> anyway but despite that despite that um when i'm playing these games i'm often seeing these situations come up where um, I will I will just be kind of like analyzing the board. I'll go to one side and then I'll realize, you know, if, if all I do is I put this like one drop thing on this side, I don't have to commit anything else to it. I, you know, I, it seems like I'll just be able to kind of steal it this way. Or I'll talk about like baiting opponents to do certain things, like getting them to try and play in one area so that I can just put a very small unit on the other side. And, and there are times that come up where like I could play more, but I just end the turn because there isn't a point to doing it um and that like that idea alone throws a lot of card games on its head where a lot of card games are going to be about how like we talk about curve curving out in card games which is like playing the most you can each turn because the player who at the end of those games the the more snowball based games where your board just builds and builds and builds the player who who used their available resources each turn to the max optimally the most efficiently should have an advantage in the game and in altered you will have a turn where you'd be like i don't think i need to play anything else and you'll have a bunch of resources and that's correct like that's actually correct because it's just preserving your resources for later because you just didn't need it this turn at all yeah for sure a lot of those instances will come up sometimes you use everything sometimes you cast one thing and you're like yep i have sufficiently lost this side and then their second action they drop something else and you're like, I literally can't beat that. There's no reason for me to waste something. I'll save up for next turn to have more options and yeah. more ways to blast through. So the thing that I think makes this really interesting, though, we like just calling back to our one and two drop discussion last time um, is that you'll you know i think i think having that flexibility of those one or two drops like we talked about is is really clutch like i i do find that when i make sure i put like a couple of one drops and a few two drops in my decks like i'm i'm able to on those turns when you need to use all your resources i'm able to flex a lot better and and get things in the right place but um as you're kind of alluding to earlier we you run out of cards fairly quickly when you're spending multiple cards every turn like I put down a one drop and a two drop, my opponent just plays a a three drop thing that just, you know, wins on its own. They're like, I spent two, they spent one. Um, but the thing that kind of flips things on its head a little bit is the reserve. Um, so the interesting thing about Altered is that uh, the one of a thousand interesting things about Altered, I got to be better about phrases like that, um, is that when you play the card, that wasn't that wasn't the use of the card that was half like half of the card and you often are still able to play it again for a second use so like when we go back to that shenlong example they they you put down three things they put down one giant thing it was kind of a three for one but it was actually kind of a one and a half for half depending but if any of those units were like fleeting how does that play into the conversation? You know, there's it's it's interesting. What, Jordan, how do you how do you gauge card advantage, or what do you think about just talking about card advantage with the reserve in mind as well? Yes. So part of the managing managing your hand in this game in particular is the reserve. In my opinion, it's kind of like an extension of your hand 
Um, but the only downside being is the opponent knows it's coming. They get to see what's there. So they can kind of, you know, you're kind of showing your hand, if you will, uh, a little bit. Uh, but you can also use it as a tool to play mind games, to get them to commit or undercommit to certain things because they, you know, they think that's the play you're going to go for and you do something else. And it allows you to kind of shuffle things through. If you're playing a deck based around um, getting stuff into the reserve as well, there's a lot of ways you can cheat it in there. And they cost different things, which also you know adds a whole nother equation to it. Uh, sometimes you'll play something that does an effect. Sometimes it doesn't have that effect coming out. So all of these decisions are small considerations you have to make. Well, small small considerations with big implications that you have to manage when you're going in to decide what goes in your deck to what you play each turn. And knowing when and where it's going to go either to discard or reserve, like you said, there are a lot of cards that have fleeting out the gate. Um, you can get some extra value by having those cards that allow you to draw and then put something in reserve. Put that in reserve because you don't get a second use out of it. Now you get a second use out of the thing you just drew, most likely, and you still get the same use out of the thing you put in reserve at the cost of letting the opponent know you have it. Oh, sorry, I said and, a whole no, lot there. but <laughs> there's, there's a lot to unpack. And, um, you know, you also you mentioned the cost of showing it to the opponent, but uh, additionally, um, the cost is in the number of reserve slots you have as well. Um, yes. In that whatever card is there is taking up a slot that could have been something earlier or so, something else later. I mean, I don't know why I said earlier, but uh, I will. Okay. Oh. No, I, I would definitely, I, I want to keep going with that line of thought, but I want to step back just for one moment because you mentioned, um, you mentioned how you'll have cards that uh, have fleeting and you have, you can have ways to put them in your reserve so that you can use them out of the reserve. And then that fleeting penalty is basically non-existent at that point. Um, and that's, that's a really interesting thing that I think when we talk about, you know, going back to the numbers of like trying to reduce things down to numbers, so we can just try and quantify efficiency of your card use in some way. Um, something that I think players just starting the game don't always catch immediately, but this idea of when you draw a card to hand, you it's, it's like a full card. It's a, it's a one it's, or, or let's just to make it easier. Let's just double everything. When you pull the card of draw a card to hand, you have two uses of it because you have that first play. And then you have the play out of the reserve, as long as you manage your reserve well. Um, when you draw a fleeting card to hand, you only have one use out of it. So it's half as many uses as anything else. But then when you use an effect that's like, like you said, there's effects that are like draw a card and then put a card in reserve or something. That drawing a card is like two cards. Putting a fleeting card from your hand in reserve is not actually reducing that one at all. It's it's keeping that one in your hand, basically. Um, so... Those, I mean, some people I think see some of those new heroes that we've have seen have seen revealed that have effects like that, um, like Trace and Rossum, who we've talked about in the last one too, uh, and don't immediately realize like this is not draw discard. Because a lot of card games will have effects that are like draw and discard. It's like, yep, I, my hand advantage stayed exactly the same. I went up one and then I went down one. But when you go draw one and then put one in there, it's like draw two, sort of, and then you're not minusing anything when you put a either a landmark because remember those also don't get fleeting when played for reserve or something mm -hmm. that already has fleeting naturally um and that's i mean when you start playing those decks and feeling that out that's where you start like watching your resources kind of skyrocket and your options are huge every turn and that's what feels really like i really enjoy that style of play i find that super super fun yep and another thing about reserve that uh you mentioned is well, that we both kind of mentioned is the the restriction. You're restricted to two for now. There may be champions in the future that have less or more. But the fact that you only have two means that go wide plan of just dropping a bunch of ones and twos all of the time will quickly become your downfall. Because not only are you using more cards, but at the end of the turn, when everything goes down and you have three, four, five dudes that are going into reserve, you now have to literally just nix an, an entire card use off of all of them you used half the card essentially and you aren't going to get that second use because you can only have two in reserve um that's why that's, that's why there's always a time and place sometimes you need that extra bodies on the field sometimes it's better to hold them back and play a big thing sometimes it's better to not play anything at all 
we um i when i'm doing those gameplay videos when i'm doing the gameplay videos on the channel i talk i think i actually made a joke about it in the last one because i i just end up talking about it like every time i talk about uh running the opponent out of resources um which usually comes up when I'm talking about playing cards with like sabotage and stuff effects that will discard cards from the reserve. Um, and this is really at the heart of the, what this conversation here is at the heart of that idea. Um, it's very, it can be very valuable. It's not usually like immediately. Sometimes sabotage is very, very immediately valuable because they're it's clear. They're going to play something and you just can like get rid of it. But sometimes it's, it's value is just a little more nuanced. Uh, in that, like I said, you know, if we if we break everything down to numbers, when you sabotage someone, uh, you are minus oneing them. You're getting rid of like one use of a card uh, if we're going to have everything doubled. Um, but the thing that I find really fascinating to watch with that is how the opponent then plays out the rest of their turn having lost that one option, because often then you're going to remove that option. Let's say they had like two cards in hand and two cards in reserve. You sabotage one of them. Okay, maybe they they were going to play that, but now they have to play something else. The other card in reserve is not very, not necessarily very good. So maybe now they'll play a card out of their hand instead because they need to uh, play something to the board, right? Um, so now they have one card in hand, one card out, and let's say maybe that turn they actually they started and they already played something from hand, right? So now they're out of resources. They have two things in play and one thing left in reserve, and now both of those cards that they played from their hand have to go to reserve. And now they're left mm-hmm. with three cards in reserve. And at that point, now, not only did your sabotage, because if they just played the card you sabotaged, they wouldn't have this issue. They played one out of reserve, and then the card they played from hand went to reserve, and they would have been at two still. But now, because you sabotaged that play for them, not only did they lose that card, but now they have to actually discard one of the cards that they played, that, or one of the cards in their reserve at the end of turn, minus wanting them a second time. But it's like... but. It's not something that you know is going to happen, but it is something that when you play the game enough times, you can kind of start to feel out like there's a chance that this will play out this way. This will play out favorably for me. Um, so like when you're using those effects, you're not only like kind of ruining a, a, an obvious direct play there, but you're you're negging them value in a way that like is for, at, overt right away, but then like sometimes has this sort of like echoing power to it in the way that it impacts how the rest of their turn plays out. And I, that's when I see that stuff happening, that's when I'm like, I remember like, okay, altered has this crazy hidden depth to it. That is like, I'm, I can't wait to see how, when we start getting the really skilled players in the game, how they start to think through these lines of play, because I feel like there's going to be some, some next level thinking, and I'm going to have to do some serious leveling up to keep up with uh, the people who get really, really good at the game. I'm excited for that too, because with some of the weird, more nuanced interactions, like the ones you said too, they're not immediately apparent, but you see it happening in other games. If you play with people enough, because there's even been stuff where I played with some friends where that exact scenario came up and it didn't even dawn on them that they're down an extra card until it's too late. Like it'll be the end of turn. They're like, all right, do this. Cause they already, cause they do what most card gamers do. Or like at the beginning of your turn, you're like, all right, I'm going to do this, this, this. And like, that's your plan. And then the small roadblock happens and you, you're a little frazzled and you're like, Oh, you know, you make the patchwork. You're like, Oh, I'll just throw this. No big deal. And then at the end of the turn, that's when they realize, Oh, that's why I didn't want to play this from hand to begin with. Cause now I have nowhere to put these reserve cards and I have to pitch another thing. And they don't even realize it until the damage is done. And that's one of the more potent sneaky ways. And plays like that opens up a myriad of, I, I believe that's the way their word's pronounced, yeah? But a myriad, myriad of uh, yeah. um, mind games you can play with people. Because now, yeah. when you do stuff too, they have to think an extra layer deep to be like, did they do this to try to play me to play a certain way or a certain thing more so than other card games? He's like, there's always mind games and card games. That's a that's a staple. But in this game, there's more room and options to mind game them because now something as simple as just doing like a simple one drop in a, in a lane. They're like, are they trying to like get me to like bait me to do something? Mm-hmm. And the something could be anything. It's not it's not some simple like, oh, they just want me to attack that thing. It's like, are they trying to get me to play this play there? What's happening? Are they trying to psych me out like there's so many extra mind games you can play 
due to the nuanced hand management and just in general, the things that happen because of it. Like another cool thing about the reserve is, like I said, that cost where you're letting them know. And like, sure, some of them, the cost is immediately apparent. It's hit the field. They know what's going to come back, maybe. Um, But those effects where you're putting it in your reserve, letting your opponent know sometimes is not the play. Sometimes you can get in their head by putting certain things down because then they're like, if they put that down there, like what else are they hiding? Like there's just so many, so many doors that open up with interactions like that. There was a, there was a, well, I think it actually didn't play out to matter, but there was, I was talking about in the last gameplay video, the one I just posted uh, today as recording this, but last week as this episode comes out, um, there was a time when my opponent was playing Fen and Crowbar, uh, which allows them to, they don't get to choose what they put in mana orbs anymore, but every turn they get to draw one card and resupply and then mana orb a, tar- a card off the top of their deck. Um, Fen and Crowbar is actually one of my favorite heroes, by the way. Um, I, I love that just like, like, I don't need to, I don't, I'm not planning my mana anymore, but I'm just getting straight resource value the rest of the game. Um, and I, I think that's really, really fun, but Fen and Crowbar flipped a paint prison right towards the end of the game into, into, they resupplied a paint prison into the reserve. Uh, Paint Prison being the Lyra removal spell that costs five or three if you discard a card from reserve. Really good with Fed and Crowbar, obviously. Um, And it puts a character or landmark on the top or bottom of the opponent's deck. The opponent gets to choose. Um, So they they put the the Paint Prison in reserve. And then I had to kind of play the turnout around the fact that Paint Prison was there. I mean, like... I didn't have to, but I chose to. I was like, oh no, okay. So I like, I, I, if I put this here, if I like all in my thing, they're just going to paint prison it. But they never actually had to use the paint prison because I just, I just played around it. And then when it, they were, then it didn't matter anymore to paint prison me. Then they just played the things they normally wanted to <laughs> instead. It was like <laughs> having it there was just causing me to play completely differently anyway. Um, and it was, it was like I got paint prison sort of without even having to get paint prison, which is really good value. Actually, if we're to talk about value, getting to pseudo use your card without having to spend the resources or lose the card. That's really good. <laughs> that's pretty decent. That's the, that's the ultimate value as a card gamer that you're looking for. That's a, that's a inf- plus infinity, not just a plus one. <laughs> um, so I wanted to pick your brain about this while we're just, uh, maybe, maybe as we're heading towards the end of the topic. Um, but one thing that I find really fascinating in Altered is how quickly your card advantage can can run out when you when you kind of get some of these issues where you play too many low drops or you're forced to play things from hand and lose things from reserve and everything. Um, so Altered Altered has the really neat thing that is in a few pretty awesome card games now where you get to draw two cards a turn, uh, mm-hmm. which is awesome because it i don't know it it's it games where you just only draw one and nothing else are starting to feel really low option to me um whereas the the actually all the games Especially we support in the late game yes all the games we support on main deck right now are either draw two or grand archive is is pseudo draw two you draw two and you have a material deck play each turn which which kind of works out about the same a lot of the time um but the uh the <laughs> In in altered though that draw two is sometimes draw two to four because of those those plays that you get with re- playing things and it goes to reserve and then playing it from reserve. Um, but despite that, you know we get to these late games sometimes and and I've forced my opponent and I've been in the position too where like I just have nothing left in hand. I maybe have a couple cards in reserve and then I draw two, and then I have to make some really. So this is where it's like it's interesting. Like how do you feel about this when you get to the stage now? Mana orbing is feeling weirdly costly because it's, it's not just optimist. one card you're yeah. putting down. It's it's like two sort of because it's it's two uses and you're already really low on resources. How how does that impact your play patterns or how do you how do you think about that when you're playing? Yeah, see, so this is a, another uh, subject I wanted to touch on. So the moment that you pivot from gathering resources to keeping the all important cards in hand. Um, this highly dependent, in my opinion, it, it's something that I think about when I'm 
thinking of how to build the deck itself is I'm always cognizant of how much everything costs on average and how many, you know, one drop, two drop, three drop, because that gives me a definitive number where I can be like, all right, once I hit this point, I can or I should just stop mana orbing. Because about that point in the game, assuming things are going, you know, whatever from bad to good to worse to better, um, I should be about at the point where I'm going to need those two cards for options and during the turn. And I don't need the mana anymore. I'll have enough mana so to play anything that I would need if I drew a big bomb or to play both cards in the same turn if that's what's necessary to take the W. And planning for the late game is very important, in my opinion, for this game in particular. Because if you don't plan for it, the second it's there, you're going to be in the position where, like you said, putting a mana orbs is basically too costly. And maybe you still need those to even play some of the cards in your deck. And now you're at the point where if you constructed it properly and your opponent is cognizant of it, they're just going to dominate you in the late game. Not because your deck is bad or anything like that, but just because you, you're just out of gas. You just The car can't move, go anymore. It doesn't matter how good the car is if the car can't move. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I I guess I didn't really answer the question, but yeah, like uh, it's something I think of with deck building and pivoting. That pivotal moment generally is a little more planned for me because I'm thinking of that moment when I make the deck. Sure, sure. So when you when you build a deck, you kind of have a plan like this is the point roughly in the game where I'm likely to stop mana orbing. Yeah. And and just keep my cards in hand and play. It's it's always a little tricky, too, though, because like. In in some TCGs, you can stop at that point a little earlier because a lot of the cards you play, um, you, you've pushed the opponent to the point maybe where you are able to win, uh, you finish the game out without having to play more mana orbs. It's like a typical like aggro deck. You're like, yeah, I stopped at five because I've already done enough damage where everything I play will just, you know, will get the job done. I don't need to push anymore. Um, or you you stop at some point because like, well, like everything in my hand is an efficient removal spell and I will just remove whatever the opponent plays. I spend way less resources than them. It really doesn't matter if I have less or more and I'll just I'll just kind of gather resources at this point. Um, but in altered, again, every turn is that fresh. Uh, I like to think about it like snowballing in the other games versus tug of war and altered. Right. It's like it's that fresh that fresh fight now that fresh fight over these areas. And if you are at six and the opponents at 10 resources, if they have enough cards in hand, that's always the catch, right? Which, which is part of the discussion, but if they have enough cards in hand, it's going to be very difficult for you to make any progress at that point, given that they just can put more stats on the board per turn until they run out. Right. And that's so like, it's a, it's a tricky, it's a tricky inflection point to try and figure out when when that is um yeah, i think for any given very, deck and game to game too yeah you i was just gonna say you got to read the field too when you make that decision I, I say i plan it in mind but normally that plan is if everything is going to plan which given card games the plan is going to fluctuate so yes. if, you know like you said if you're gonna get that big w by not mana orbing right away so you can play the card that you're gonna mana orb and that'll win you the game in this turn or the next turn then by all means, you keep it. Or if you know, you're know you drawing your last out, if they got rid of the other two outs and you just drew it and you really need it, but you need you know both cards, you might just forego mana orbing for the one turn just to hold on to the cards because you know those will help secure the game. There's a lot, and that's one of the reasons I love Alter 2 is because it, it opens it up for those types of decisions that make. Sometimes you've probably had games like that where you had the all like and it's a tough decision every time too which you can tell it's a good decision making because every time it's the start of the turn both me and my opponent on almost every time i played the game with someone in demo days or playing on exalted there's always that like uh, i don't know which one to put down because yeah. you you see a you see a world where both of these are the thing that plays out for that turn and you're like uh, or the best one is the opening hand. The hardest decision of my life is deciding which half of my hand is going down and which one is it. Yeah, it's so many. It's so many cards to put down. Um, 
And I, I'm going to be honest too. Actually, this conversation alone is is making me think about some things a little bit because I don't know how often I'm actually looking at my opening hand and looking at like fleeting cards and thinking this is half as many cards as some of the non-fleeting cards in my hand. Um, because I think, I do think, I mean, those are often, obviously they're fleeting because they're usually like really good. They're like really good removal spells or something. But those are also to me like easy, uh, easy mana orbs, just considering that you, the, whatever other ones you keep will actually be played two turns in a row. And again, like, like we're saying, like you don't, you know, like it's imagine, let's imagine like a Bravos Tracer or something. It's a fleeting one that you could just pop in your man orbs if you want to, because its stats are crazy. But if you only needed a one, one, one to win on that side, you, you should have just kept the one, 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 right. <laughs> and like got two uses out of it instead. So man, it is, it is a, it is an agonizing choice in the, the best way possible every time. And, and now I think I'm like, I'm taking from this conversation another perspective to think about to continue to try to be an anywhere near half decent altered player in the many gameplay videos I'm putting out. You're planning to be the best altered gameplay. I, I want to produce the um, entertaining content that people enjoy watching every week. Uh, and sometimes though, it's not fun to watch someone who's really bad. So <laughs> um, I do have to, I have to at least try and reach a certain level of, of play quality. Uh, and I will continue to strive to get there uh, before we end this topic, Jordan, just cause like, it feels like weird that we didn't like explicitly mention it, but effects that allow you to draw cards or resupply. Um, those are, those are kind of interesting in alter too, because often they're tacked on to things that aren't progressing the board that much for you. And it really, it really comes down to how well, um, how well you can play to that board, I think is the main thing I have to say about those. So I'm, I'm thinking about things like Izmir's like Baba Yaga, um, who's on a, it's on an okay body. Uh, it's, a, it's on a small body ultimately, uh, but it's got a full card draw on it. Um, or uh, Lyra's Daughter got Yisco? the, or what? Oh, Daughter, Daughter of Yggdrasil. Yeah, Daughter of Yggdrasil on a huge body, but gives the opponent a full card in hand. Um, oh, I was talking about the rare one. So your opponent gets one too, but you get one. Oh, but you get one as well. Yes. And the, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. You're right. I was, I was, I did mention the rare one. Um, and we have like, like uh, the croupier. I suddenly am blanking on the first word in the Lyra character's name, even though I've played it like six times in this gameplay video I put out today. Um, but the croupier is on a die roll. Uh, one through three, you resupply and a four through six, you draw a card. Um, but that's on a, that's on a four cost zero four, four body, which is like actually solid. So I actually think that card is low key, like pretty good. Um, but, uh, those, so those are, those are all interesting cards in, in the way that they, they sacrifice, um, you know, some stats often or, or some ability to kind of just like push decently on the turn, but in, in exchange, they're putting themselves out there, drawing you a card or resupplying or something. And then potentially doing it again. Um, the croupier is a, from hand, so that won't happen. But you still get to put the card out again to get the stats again. Um, which so like, do you how much how much stock do you put in those cards when you're building decks? Well, one of my favorite decks it was an Axiom deck, and it has three copies of one of the best landmarks in the game. If I'm if I'm talking from my own perspective, uh, I forget I always forget what it's called. Reprocessor. The one that's resupplies it. Is it reprocessing? Okay. Yep. Axiom yeah. reprocess. Uh, resupplies every afternoon. I think that card is bonkers good because like if we're if we're counting reserve cards as one and cards in hand as two, that basically is just plus one every turn it's there. After being alive for one turn, it's replaced itself. And every other turn after that, it's straight profit. And there's a lot of cards that we've already mentioned that uh, there's cards that have better effects in reserve. Than they do, you know, from hand or being a fleeting card, they're just as good in reserve. So having an engine, potentially two, that's just constantly feeding you cards, it makes it so much easier to glide into the mid to late game, knowing that if your opponent doesn't have heavy draw, 
like you said, you can just go like lean hard into the strategy of I don't need to win yet. I just need to bleed my opponent dry so I can just walk it in later when they have one card a turn that they can play. And I but, have two to three to four, maybe if you don't drop, if you stop dropping uh, mana. The big, the big drawback, of course, is that like, whereas Baba Yaga and Croupier would give you a body, the reprocessor can get you a lot more cards, but the turn you play it, you're probably winning nothing. Um, if you play it early enough, if you play it late enough, it's not getting you as many cards. So, which is yeah. why I play Oddball, because then I get a two-two-two body in addition. <laughs> yep, yep. Sierra and Oddball still very good. I think still still oh, very yeah. good. Very very powerful. The change deck. was necessary. It made it so you don't just bulldoze people in the beginning, but mid to late game, and even you know by turn two, it's it's still a uh, it's still doing its job. It's still pogging. Still, still, as Jordan says, Sierra and Oddball still pogging, still <laughs> pogging to this day. I love it. Um, all right, Jordan. So uh, do you feel like we've explored that topic well enough? You want to get a few mailbag well, questions in here? Yeah. We Any can, last we shots? Can, uh, we can wrap it up for now and uh, get into some epic mailbag. Epic mailbag. Here we go. The fleeting thoughts. Epic mailbag brought to you by. The Epic Game Store. That's not that's not true at all, actually. Ooh, ooh, <laughs> That'd be cool, Epic though. <laughs> hey, anyone, anyone want to write to them? Let them let them know. <laughs> OK, <laughs> anyway. Um, so uh, but our mailbag, we have Fleeting Thoughts mailbag is always open. We're trying to get some questions in here. And as we you know, as we continue through the year, as we mentioned earlier, um, we'll often be just kind of like we're, we're looking for news on altered. So mailbag questions are super welcome all the time. You can leave a mailbag question for us uh, at any point by leaving a comment down in the video. Um, I'm sometimes a little confused as to whether or not it is a, you just want me to answer the question right now, or if you want it to be discussed on the episode. So uh, make sure to just put um, like fleeting thoughts, mailbag or hashtag fleeting thoughts, mailbag into the comment. So I know that, okay, we'll talk about this or I won't just like pop in and answer it. Or you can send an email to maindeckgames at gmail.com and put in the subject Fleeting Thoughts Mailbag. Uh, and we will add that to our document here. And today we're going to cover, uh, we're going to cover at least one old question and then one that was sent to us a little more recently. And we're going to keep kind of doing that um, going forward just to make sure if you had a question, it hasn't been answered yet, it will get answered. And if you put one in recently, you don't have to wait for 30 episodes <laughs> to get it answered as I, I, yeah, I'm trying to just balance that out a little bit. Um, so our first question is one from a while ago, uh, from the altered discord. This was from Pierre who has been in the Alter discord for a long time, uh, to the point where their, their name is Trinian Platts old pal, which is not something a lot of people understand, but before they released the print and play, you know, I don't even know if it's worth going into, but it's, it was just a small meme in the Alter discord for a while. Um, <laughs> They asked, Pierre asked, are you guys draft or sealed players? Is this something you're excited for when it comes to altered? Jordan, what do you think of that? I love draft and sealed formats. I like to try them at least once. I won't say every game is made for them because there's been a couple draft and sealed formats we played for certain games that the game itself is great, but it's just not a good draft or it's not a good sealed. But alter, I feel, and I think you've had some experience at the event you went to with one of those events but i feel like altered is going to be an exciting drafter sealed especially well partly because of the uniques having those be in the game in general is going to make draft and sealed particularly novel compared to other games because other games everyone are always knows what it is going to the pool in this you might have a bunch of uniques. You might have no uniques in the pool and you won't know until you sit across from the player and they drop their unique on the field. And you're like, what does this do? I, I have no idea how to plan. This is going to be exciting. I feel like that's the best way to encompass it is the, the sealed and draft formats are going to be exciting in this game. And based on how they've made the card pool from, from what I've looked at so far, I feel like both draft and sealed are going to be pretty robust and very doable um, from what I've heard from the rule that, you know, the test rule set that you got to play with. 
Yeah, uh, uh, regarding the uniques, like it's one thing in a card game where like someone pulls like a rare, an ultra rare card, a mythic rare card or whatever. You're like, oh, wow. Like I didn't expect to play against that. It's another thing when they put a card down, you're like, I I literally never have seen this before. And there was no possibility for me to have ever seen this before. <laughs> and now I have to figure out what to do about it. Um, so that certainly is exciting. Um, yeah, I... Having played draft, I, I we didn't play sealed, um, but my guess is that draft is really going to be the thing you want to play. Um, I think sealed will work uh, just fine, but because draft draft is so cool in this game because you get to mix three factions together with a with a hero ability, and the the hero just has to be one of those three factions. Um, and the the ways that you can mix these together uh, are just are just exciting. Um, the, in the draft that I did, I played Fen and Crowbar, uh, so I was getting free resupplies, and so I got to put in lots of cool fleeting spells from like Is, from Izmir that I just knew. Wow, well, whenever I flip that in there, like I just it's I get the full value out of it every single time. Um, I got some I got like Muna Druids and stuff for Muna that like when I put when I resupply them, I get to anchor things and, and stuff like it's it's fun to get to look at. The reason I think drafts people are really going to like draft is because when you find that hero you want to play as in the draft, then you get to you get to beeline and you're you're getting all three different factions. and You keep every single pack. I swear, like it was getting past packs and I was like. Oh man, this would be so cool with that one hero. If I had drafted that one instead, I could oh, I could be taking all these and like putting this cool thing together. Um, you're just gonna keep seeing these new interactions that you don't get to normally see in the regular single faction constructed. That I think it's going to be a fresh experience every single time. And yeah, so I am also a draft or sealed player. Um, I play I play a lot of sealed on like online games because like drafting does take time and effort and and something but uh i think i would prefer to draft this game because i love how much you can really focus in on weird and and wonky strategies um and i think the decks are just going to be a total blast to play i mean i know it i've done it (laughs) i know they're going to be a blast to play it was a blast yeah i was already excited for the sealed and draft and then when you told me the the rule set for the draft you played uh in in france i was like yo draft is gonna be sick yeah just just the opportunity to mix factions is gonna be sick on its own yes yep yeah it's super super exciting cannot wait um next question let's let's go uh, we got emailed this question this is from adrian uh hello dan and jordan first of all thank you a lot for your kind okay this is a nice thing these very nice things to us i just don't need i don't i feel like to i need to indulge myself in reading them out for everyone thank you for the kind words adrian um we'll get right to the question i've been theory crafting a lot and would be very interested to hear your thoughts about this question which heroes do you think will allow the most creativity for players in the deck building process and conversely with whom are we more likely to see similar decks? Considering the three uniques probably won't have enough impact to change a whole deck synergy. Agreed. Um, and having in mind, of course, that half the cards are not revealed yet. And also greetings from Paris, which I, I hope to go back to again soon. Paris was awesome. Um, well, I have I read a question. So Jordan, why don't you start again while I, I collect my thoughts? This is a really, I think, a really interesting question um, and one that's definitely worth talking about. For sure. So the first thing, I'll address the first part, which is which hero do you uh, think offers the most? Creativity. Yeah, it's a hard decision because one of the things I love about the way they're designed outside of a few is they're pretty open ended as to what you can and can't do with them, which I I think they they bring up that they bring up that some of them are are going to. you know, probably be built pretty similarly. We're going to see some similar decks for them. And like, I think, I think I can agree to that with, with some of these, I think like, for example, you know, Sierra and oddball is one where I I think there will be variation for sure, but the general concept of the deck is you need to play landmarks to get the brass bugs. 
and yep. you're going to put some good landmarks in and you're going to play them and get the brass bucks um, and yep. build that machine every time. And I think there will be a lot of, I think people will really hone in on a few landmarks that are generally considered like, yeah, the like best. these are really good value. Um, there'll be All some the permanents, not landmarks. Landmarks are a type of permanent. Well, uh, I don't remember as, which, which one Sierra Adodball says on it, but I believe it says landmarks on the card. It does say permanent. Okay, well, sure. And when we see new types of permanence, then that I think that deck will start to get very different in that case. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, like Sierra and Oddball is one of the ones that I was going to say is not is less open ended just because its ability hinges on a specific card type. But I feel like most of the other ones, um, you know, they're pretty they're pretty open ended of what you could do with them. I mean, some of them function around a mechanic. But that mechanic is generally heavily tied to what that color or faction is doing anyway. Um, but as far as ones that I'd say is the most open ended, I'd maybe I'd maybe say Akisha and Taru, just oh, because yeah. it's it allows you to being able to always let your opponent go first. Also allows you to build some maybe more complex strategies that you can't without knowing what your opponent's first move is. Um, and that kind of lets you either play, you know, fast and loose like you normally would or, you know, tighten to the chest, keep everything up until you're ready to blast or some, you know, mid range thing where you're just kind of playing the field, using that after you to your advantage to know where to divert your your mid game at. Um, but it's, it's think... such a hard question because, like I said, like most of them, they did such a good job at designing them to their they're not one specific like this deck is always going to do this thing i think one of the big advantages altered has that leads towards a lot of creativity or, or should lead towards a lot of creativity is the rare system and the out of faction rares um that like i've been able to sit down even with this small card pool and like come up with some very different builds for different heroes when you start to take some of those into account and like and as I mentioned in some of those some of those gameplay videos too, like some of these out of faction cards are better than you think. Like there is some huge value to just being able to put a vanilla four 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 for three into your Lyra deck. It's it's just good. Like it's just good. It's like Lyra doesn't always cover all three stats well. They have a lot of zeros. So when you have that in, it's like oh, this was the out I normally wouldn't have to the situation playing this faction, but. There, boom it just like guess what i have four in all stats for three um like so i think people and oh izmir stargazer the out of faction one that's literally just a one 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 for one um or is it a one two whatever i don't know it's just a it's just a small vanilla drop um that that is another one that surprised me when i was playing that uh in the whichever the axiom deck i think it was the axiom deck it was like just having a, a one drop I needed more one drops when I was playing uh, Trace and Rossum because I needed to get things into reserve fast so I could turn them on. Um, and yeah, it was, it was, it, that introduces a lot of surprising variability where you'll go up against people playing those decks and they'll be putting some of those out of faction cards in. And you'd be like, I did not expect that to be one of your rares. And it's very frustrating because it's really good right now for some reason. Um, I, I want to add, I think Arjun and Spike to the list of, of one that is like probably, I think there's going to be some more variants in it, but the, again, the concept's going to be pretty similar. A lot of the time you're just trying to get the best three drops possible and anchor them down. Um, Arjun spike allows you to uh, uh, exhaust him and then discard a card from your reserve to make the next three or less cost character you play come in anchored. Um, so, there, there's. I think there's going to be like plant based Arjun and spikes. There's going to be ones that don't care about plant plant typo as much. Um, I mean, there's going to be some other weird ones using some like cool out of faction cards. I'm sure, but again, like so, there will be creativity. I, I don't think any of these decks is not going to have creativity, even not talking about uniques. Um, but I think some, especially if they mention like specific types of cards or specific costs or something will tend to get a little more funneled than others, if that makes sense. For sure. Um, 
What do we got here? Let's, uh, let's do one more. Let's do one more just to keep them moving here. Um, let's grab a YouTube comment from our last one as well. Uh, okay, we'll grab we'll grab this one. So Poing333 on YouTube said, would be interested in y'all's thoughts on so many people having signed uncut sheets. I feel like it's cool for collectors that just want one, but for people slash retailers planning on selling them to recoup some of the expense, I think printing so many will greatly diminish the value of them. That's an interesting topic because in the last one we were talking about how the Kickstarter finished. Um, and instead of having 20 people at the top level, they had what was like 120 or more than that. I can't, I, maybe I'm blanking on, on the number here, but there were many, many, many more people at the divine pledge. I'm actually just pulling it up now. So I don't lie on the podcast. Uh, 320. I knew there was a 20 in there. 320 people back the divine pack, um, making the amount of, uh, Uncut sheets a lot more than what were previously going to be there. So, what are my thoughts on that? What are well, no, Jordan. What are your thoughts? Because you backed that level. How do you feel about it? You you actually are personally affected. Let me know. Well, I'm indifferent on it. Okay. Uh, part of me wanted to sell some of the uncut sheets to recoup the cost, um, but yep. I do feel like they're going to be devalued. Part of me, you know, I want to keep at least one and kind of like frame it uh, just because it's a it's a cool it's a cool thing to own um, for games. Um, there's also the question, which I, I'm not sure. Maybe, you know, Dan, um, but I don't know if anyone's asked it to them. They might have the uncut sheets if they are going to be actually like live cards, because if they are, that's going to increase the value greatly, because if you can buy an uncut rare sheet and get a copy of every rare card that's on that sheet. That now just made it, you know, it's more than just a collector's item at that point, too, because you can get a fair amount of rares by just being like, yo, got these uncut sheets. So, so it's uh, there's some un- un- unanswered, unanswered questions for me personally, but also it, it affects me, but not a whole lot. I'm Like I said, I'm indifferent on it. Part of me is really sad because they are devalued or they will be devalued. And part of me also doesn't care because the more people having cool stuff is never a bad thing. Um, my wife asked the same thing actually about the uncut sheets when I, I think she was musing about the idea of actually backing that level. And I was like, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's uh, something that we can handle right now. Um, but, uh, I actually just checked the discord and, uh, Eric Laz, who I always trust to be pretty on top of the ball here, answered someone and said, the uncut sheets will not have QR codes. He's not part of Equinox, but he really keeps his ear to the ground on everything. So I would feel pretty safe and trusting that the uncut sheets will not have QR codes. Um, they are purely just for display purposes. Um, interestingly, like in a lot of card games, actually, you can cut the uncut sheet and then have the actual cards if you're very carefully cut it and it'd be very difficult for some people to detect. Um, but that is not the case in Altered, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Um, I mean, it kind of is, just not at an official tournament. Right. Right, but but altered you could just get for non official you yeah yeah it's it's like it doesn't it doesn't matter it's yeah it's interesting they're really just like collector pieces, um, yeah I I guess it well, I could say from my selfish perspective I I think I'm excited about it because I can probably get one of Jordan's pretty cheap, <laughs> um, yeah I guess uh. This uh, this kind of brings up the conversation of always like like people who are buying into the game because they're excited about the game, because they want to play the game, because they want to collect the game versus people that are simply trying to like, you know, get a good uh, a financial investment of some kind. Um, I and and at the end of the day, I always say it, it all comes down to the easiest way you break this down is if you want to financially invest, you should go trade stocks you should go buy bonds you should financially invest in like the things that are built to be financial investments if you're coming to altered and um and you're backing the divine pledge thinking that you're gonna get like a it's gonna be like stonks free money because you're just gonna sell the uncut sheets that um 
I, 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 that's totally fine if that's how you want to approach things, but I don't think that's, I don't think that's the purpose of that, of those in that tier. I think the purpose of those uncut sheets there is that if you're backing at the $5,000 pledge, you're excited about the game and you're going to value the collector pieces, not for what they make, what they're worth on the secondary market, but for the fact that you were able to back the Kickstarter when it was live and get those six uncut sheets. So to my mind, if we're going to, if I'm, if I'm, and maybe I'm being naive, maybe I'm being, um, you know, too, uh, too romantic, I guess, about the whole idea. But I would like to think that a lot of the people who backed at that level uh, are interested in the, the fact that they can have those uncut sheets or split them with their friends who, who joined the level with them or something. Um, and they can all appreciate just the, that collectible. Cause I think that's the, that's the purpose of it. So if I, if I approach it from that angle, um, I think it's great that so many people can have their own cut sheets because I'd like to believe that they're all excited about that. Um, and I can probably grab one a little cheaper so I can have it too. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I definitely, uh, like I said, in, I have that sentiment as well. Um, like when we were talking among some of our friends about maybe splitting the divine pack, we didn't even have the uncut sheets as part of like the monetary discussion. We basically just took the price of the divine pack and divided the boxes. And we're just like, you're paying basically for the boxes. And then depending on how much you get, you're just going to get an uncut sheet part. As yeah, part it's of just, the deal. it's just part like, of the, part for of us, the it's the enjoyment of being like, look at this cool thing I have, not I'm going to buy it so I can sell. For yeah. me, the selling was more so if I had the whole divine pack to myself, because I mean, I don't I don't need six huge frame uncut sheets. I need one. Yeah, maybe but two. It looked cool, though. <laughs> just uh, every room on my downstairs is just altered uncut sheets. Yes. <laughs> no, because I got to have room for the six signed art pieces. True. True. No, fair enough. Good point. Good point. Um, yeah, I hope, I hope that's a reasonable answer. I mean, like that's, that's always a tough question because it comes down to different people who have different, different values and what they're doing in the game. But, um, we, here at main deck, we like to, we like to really look at the, the hobby as a hobby, the game as a game and the uncut sheets as a collectible that you will hopefully enjoy if you're getting, um, I don't, I don't think people are going to be disappointed with their divine pledge backing, even if the uncut sheets aren't massive stonks on their own, because, uh, I think these boxes are already going to be pretty valuable um, for people to get. Oh, so, very much so. Yeah. So I think I think it's a good deal either way. So I I wouldn't be too upset about it. I guess personally, if I if I were backing there. Um, all right. So yeah, I think that well that'll do it for our mailbag today. But once again, just a reminder: go ahead and leave a comment down below with a hashtag Fleeting Thoughts Mailbag if you want to add a question to our mailbag for us to get to in a future episode. It might not be the next one, but it'll be at some point. Um, or send an email to maindeckgames at gmail.com subject fleeting thoughts mailbag and we really love those questions so thank you so much for helping us uh, continue to have interesting things to talk about um, during our uh, what? how many episodes are we going to have before we have product it's going to be like let's see one like two three four five six seven a good like maybe eight or nine episodes before we have product in our hand here I think so um, that's a really quick, quick maths there, but like, well, oh, I thought you were asking about total. No, I think, I think we'll have about eight or nine more episodes still before we get to open any booster packs of altered. Um, so your questions are greatly appreciated as we, uh, as we just come up with what we think are somewhat interesting things to talk about with altered before we even have the full game or, or can start building true decks in our hands. So, um, Jordan, why don't, you, why don't you take us out of here? It was a good episode. It was a fun episode. Yeah. And as Dan said, thank you guys very much for your questions. We love talking about them. But as the day comes to a close, that was our fleeting thoughts. Thanks for watching, and we hope to talk with you again in about two weeks. Goodbye. Bye, everyone.